Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. For the past couple of weeks, we have been talking about why we struggle, particularly as Americans and people in Western society. Why do we struggle to rest? And we've already talked about underlying societal beliefs and expectations. We talked about internalized capitalism. We've talked about our nervous system and how it can get stuck in fight or flight. But today we're going to explore what happens when you weave your identity with the traits of the overachiever. Now, do any of these sound like you? You get a serious high from accomplishing something, especially something big, but you also beat the living hell out of yourself when you fail or even when you don't do as well as you hoped. One of the phrases that comes to mind for me is second place is the first loser. Do you have that kind of attitude? Do you live in the past or in the future, but you have a really hard time staying present? You're either nitpicking what you said or did wrong yesterday or yesteryear, or you're worried about the deadline or event that is or may be coming in the future. Do you use your achievements to prove to yourself and others that you're good enough? But even when you achieve them, there's a part of you that just feels like a big fat fake. Do you often neglect relationships for work? Are you likely to also let yourself down and skip things you find fun or relaxing in order to keep grinding? Does everything else get put on the back burner so you can keep running on the hamster wheel? Do you keep telling yourself you'll rest when this thing you're working on is over? But when the task ends, somehow magically your calendar has already filled up with other things that keep you busy and once again you put off resting. I remember back when I was in the depths of high demand religion trying to do it all, homeschooling, running a wedding photography business, fulfilling several hours of church callings throughout the week, being a wife, a mother, keeping house, trying to keep my house perfectly clean, putting creative dinners on the table, doing the family finances, like so many things that I was trying to do. And I would tell myself that, I'll rest when I'm dead. That was like my phrase, like, oh, I'm going to get all this done and I'll rest when I'm dead. Do you prize yourself on not taking care of yourself and not resting? Do you kind of wear it like a badge of honor? Do you avoid criticism and feedback like the plague? Criticism is a chronic overachiever's kryptonite because it triggers that part of you that fears deep down that you're not enough. My guess is you also feel anxious a lot. Remember last week when we talked about the sympathetic nervous system? Because you overstuff your life with to-dos and work, you have high cortisol levels from stress. And those cortisol levels keep you in fight or flight. One of the symptoms of fight or flight is anxiety. You probably also don't take time to really acknowledge and celebrate your achievements. My guess is as soon as you achieve something... You might have like a brief moment of feeling good, loving all the accolades you get, but sometimes before your head even hits the pillow that night, you're already on to the next thing, stressing about how you're going to get the next thing done and dreaming even bigger. You don't just allow yourself to sit in the moment even for a full day. If you are in corporate America, you're probably one of the first people in the office and probably one of the last to leave. In high school, you were probably the person that did like 15 clubs. 
And believe me, there is no judgment here. I was that person too. We're talking, you know, starting from the early morning, I was doing an hour of early morning seminary with church and then showing up for zero period for a madrigal class for choir. And then I was in the marching band and debate team. I was on the auto mechanics group. We had like a competitive auto mechanics group that I was part of. Club soccer, the cheer squad. What else did I do? Like National Honor Society, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, and then on top of that, all of my church obligations where I, you know, was supposed to be there on Wednesday nights and I often had like weekend things that were going on. And then on top of that, trying to stay in the top 10% of my class so that I could get scholarships and continue to achieve outside of high school. Everything I did was incredibly goal oriented and focused and it brought me lots of great things. We'll talk about that in a minute. It brought me lots of benefits, but it was also exhausting. My guess is you know what this is like. We're kindred spirits here. I used to go for like a month straight. I would work, 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 work. You know, I was surviving off of like four hours of sleep every night, going to bed at like one in the morning, waking up at five in the morning to get ready to go to early morning seminary, which started at six in the morning. So I was doing all of this and I could go for about a month and then I'd crash and I'd stay home and I'd sleep a full like 36 hours. So I'd go to bed one night, sleep an entire next day into the next morning, and then I'd wake up and do it all again for a month. I mean, we're talking craziness. Those cortisol levels were insane. And they continued to be insane throughout my young adult life. And I didn't start reevaluating it until like my mid-30s. And I still struggle with it sometimes. We'll talk about that in just a minute too. So if this is you, no judgment. I'm right there with you. We're on the same path. So if you're hearing these things and feeling triggered or feeling bad or feeling ashamed, honor that. That's good information, but also understand there is no judgment here. This is all good information about what's going on for us. And the more we can create that sense of compassion for ourselves and that sense of, okay, like this is good information. I have valid reasons for why I do this, but it's not serving me. Open up, give yourself that space so that you can learn from what your inner wisdom is telling you so that you can make changes that are healthier for you, that give you more of what you want. So if you're hearing these things, right there with you. We are on the same path. My guess is also, if you're listening to this and a lot of these other things are resonating, you probably identify as a perfectionist. If that's true, there is an episode on perfectionism. We talk a lot about why we get into perfectionistic patterns. It was really helpful for me, the information in that podcast, really helpful for my own perfectionistic patterns and allowed me to understand myself and have more compassion. And I share some of the things that I use to move forward. So go check out the perfectionism episode. And you might also identify as a people pleaser. And right by the perfectionism episode is a episode on people pleasing. So go check those out if this is something that you struggle with. A couple of last things that you probably experience if you're an overachiever is you probably keep score in your relationships. So not only do you kind of keep people at arm's length, because underneath all of this achievement is sort of a sense that you're not enough. And so you want people to see the pretty shiny facade, but you don't want them to get close enough to kind of see the chinks in your armor. So you might keep people at arm's length, but you also probably keep score because my guess is that you're doing things for people and you're keeping track of what other people are doing in the relationship. And when they do something for you, you either respond in kind or you go over and above. And if people aren't pulling their weight according to your expectations, you keep track of that. And you probably are holding some resentment towards people in your life that aren't doing as much as you do. This particularly shows up in marriages. Kevin and I should probably do an episode just on this because earlier in our marriage, when I was unaware of these patterns, 
I would keep track of, and I'm talking like physical lists of everything I did versus everything he did. And I was mad as hell. And so we've been able to work through those things and decide what is and isn't working for me and where he could step it up and his expectations and my expectations. And let's just say my expectations at the time were superhuman, even for two people, superhuman. I was expecting the work of like 10 people from myself. And so sitting down with that and really getting realistic about expectations allowed us to kind of decide what we did want to do and what we didn't want to do and who was going to do it and allow ourselves to kind of open up conversation to make the workload in our home more bearable. But before that time, oh, resentful as hell. And part of that is internalized patriarchy and those episodes are coming up. So I had internalized patriarchy inside of me. My husband had internalized patriarchy inside of him because of course we did. We were raised in a patriarchal high demand religion where we were told that both of us had certain roles and that if we weren't fulfilling those roles, we were bad people. I mean, no one actually said you're a bad person, but it was implied. So of course... So we will do some episodes on that. And then also one interesting fact about overachievers is if your relationship is unhappy, you're actually more likely to stay in an unhappy relationship because you hate failure. And whether it's at work or with your kids or in your marriage or with your parents, failure is failure. And you worry deeply about what people will think of you if you fail. So you often stay long after the expiration date of a relationship or you don't talk about conflict and you just sit there and you stew in it that they're not doing their part or that things aren't working. Now, if this felt like some rapid hits to your feels, stay tuned because we're going to be talking about why we engage in these anxious or insecure overachievement patterns, how they've served us in the past and how we can move into a healthy relationship with ourselves, which is key. Underneath all of this is self-worth issues. So we need to be able to move into a healthy relationship with ourselves and with the idea of achievement so we can finally rest and enjoy our lives instead of running around like hamsters on a never-ending treadmill of activity. Now, before we go any further in this episode, I have a quick and easy ask. If you feel this podcast is helping you understand and accept yourself better, and if you feel these resources should be amplified so that more people have access to them as they deconstruct high demand religion and family trauma, please take a couple of short minutes and head over to my website, emancipateyourmind.org, and make a $10 donation. It is so easy and it is tax deductible in the United States. Go to emancipateyourmind.org. The donation area is on the right-hand side at the top of the page under the words, support the podcast and give a gift. Click the monthly donation button if you'd like to automatically fund the research and broadcast each month so we can make sure no person goes through religious deconstruction without emotional and mental support. So what are you getting from the constant high-speed marathon of overachievement? That's a really, really good question. You likely developed the pattern in childhood, big shocker, right, for one or more of a couple of reasons. So the first reason is a little bit more straightforward. So in your childhood or sometime earlier in your life, you experience some kind of physical or financial insecurity. So we're talking like poverty, famine, war, natural disaster, divorce, even a big move can bring some of this about. For whatever reason, your basic needs of shelter, food, water, personal security, employment, sleep, etc. felt threatened at one point in your life and you told yourself, never again. I will work so hard and make myself so secure that nothing bad can ever happen to me again. If you fall into this camp, you have a hard time resting and enjoying life because you're always worried something bad is going to happen if you quit being diligent. 
you're always worried about the what if. So that might be one of the reasons that you've got this kind of insecure or anxious overachievement going on. And the other one is actually a little bit more common, but it can be a combination of both. You grew up in a really poor household and there were some attachment issues going on with your caregivers. That is totally possible. But it is possible it can be one or the other. The second one is we used overachievement as a way to get attention or love in our family. We realized that we got lots of attention and people gushed whenever we achieved something, especially if it was something that met the family values. So if your family was really big into sports and you were accomplishing things at sports, tons of attention, tons of validation. And so you continue to overachieve in that area. This can be true with academics or with church attendance or hitting certain milestones at church. It can be true with marriages or relationships or friendships or popularity or business. Whatever the accomplishments were that your family valued are probably the ones that you began overachieving in first. This can also be true if you're the scapegoat. If you notice someone else in the family was getting lots of love and attention for accomplishing things, you may have tried to mimic that and you may have constantly tried to achieve things to get some sort of validation, to be treated like a human, to be seen as special. And even if you didn't get that validation, you may have developed a pattern where you continued to try. And every time you didn't get validation, it it hit your self-worth even harder. So you may have developed patterns of achieving to try to prove yourself and to get people's love and admiration and even just their acceptance. But deep down, you may not feel like you're worthy. This can also happen even if your parents aren't narcissists or they're not unhealthy, but if they were sick and they didn't have the ability to give you lots of energy and attention because they were sick. Even if they were taking care of a sibling that was sick or had some sort of disability that took a lot of their parental time and attention, you may have felt like you weren't as important and maybe they thought that they were being supportive when they gushed over your achievements. But it may have felt like the only time that you really got that approval and so you continued in this pattern. This can also be true if you had family members that made big sacrifices like dropping out of college or choosing to become a parent instead of having an abortion or taking jobs they hated in order to support you or immigrating to a new country or even if they had a life that was just unfulfilling and you knew that they just weren't happy with their life, you may feel like you need to make their investment worth it or you need to make it up to them somehow by living larger than life and really becoming someone, you know? So in my life, my mom got pregnant with me when she was in college. My birth father decided not to be a part of the picture, leaving my mom a young 19-year-old single mother, and she had to drop out of college. She didn't get to be the band director she wanted to be. She didn't get to continue taking all the percussion classes that lit her up and made her so happy inside. And she moved back home with her parents, gave birth to me, and was a single mother for the first six months of my life until my father came into the picture. Not my sperm donor, my father. He came into the picture, my Mexican dad, and he raised me as his own. But I grew up knowing that my mom gave up her dreams because she got pregnant. And as a young child, I assumed that she made those sacrifices for me. And I often felt sad for her. My mother loved percussion. In fact, one of my favorite things about my mom is listening to her cook. She has this vegetable chopper, and it is just cadence after cadence. She just chops vegetables in these really cool cadences while she's making food. So I knew that was my mother's dream. I knew that it was heartbreaking for her to have to leave college, especially so young, and then to be thrust into single motherhood. And my mom never put that on me. Like, you have to make me proud. You have to make my investment worth it. 
But I came to that belief and that assumption. I'm the one that as a young child somehow got it in my head that I had to make it all worth it for my mom and make up for her losses. And that was a lot of burden on my young shoulders. Not my mom's fault. It's not what she was trying to do. There were no hints that I owed her. And yet I still got that message. So maybe you did too. You might have parents that often talk about the sacrifices they made in order to immigrate to a country where you would have more opportunities. Or you might have parents that just you can tell they hate their job, but you know that they work the job because that's what provides food and shelter for you. And there may be some subconscious beliefs that you develop about what you owe them because of that. Whatever the reason, becoming obsessed with achievement gave you a sense of control during chaos and a sense of approval and self-worth. On top of that, my guess is that your affinity for overachievement also brought you a lot of other benefits. It definitely did for me. You may have been recognized a lot in school and treated as a positive example for your peers. You may have earned scholarships and been chosen for competitive positions on sports teams and with prestigious companies. You created awe in some of your peers at how much you achieve. They put you on a pedestal. And you created jealousy and maybe even hatred in others who were dealing with their own deep insecurity. You've gotten a lot of benefits from this behavior pattern. Look back on all you've accomplished. These are all things that you've built. You built this incredible life that is yours. But the reason you're listening to this podcast is you probably also feel really tired and maybe even a little empty inside. You want to get off the merry-go-round, but you're so dizzy, you're not sure where to find the exit. So first, let's talk about healthy achievement. I know firsthand that your ambition and the excitement you get from achieving things, it's not going to go anywhere. It's part of who you are. You love the excitement of learning something new. You love that hit, that feeling you get when you're like, yeah, I did that. It feels good to learn and expand and grow. We're built that way as humans. That's not going anywhere. And there's a part of you that's pretty proud of all the things that you can accomplish. I know you feel that sense of, yeah, I'm pretty badass. I get a lot of things done. You might even wear your busyness like a badge or your achievements like a badge. Like, yeah, I get shit done. I'm that person. I'm the person that gets up and gets going. But my guess is you also want to learn to be present and actually enjoy what you're creating instead of always feeling like you're not allowed to rest. In order to create that for yourself, you have to know what a healthy relationship with achievement would look like. So here are some of the traits of healthy achievers. First, they enjoy the process, not just the achievement. When I was in college, I had a professor in sociology. His name was Dr. Marshall. And on one of the first days of class, he's looking at all these 18, 19, 20-year-olds. And he said, I want you to raise your hand. If you woke up this morning and thought to yourself, yes, I graduated high school. And all of us kind of looked at each other like, no, we're not still doing that. And he said, what? You spent 18 years of your life building up to that accomplishment. At least 12 years of active work towards this accomplishment. And you're telling me just a year later or even two or three years later, you're not still celebrating this accomplishment that took you a good 12 years of education to achieve. And all of us were like, uh, no, should we be? And he said, this is a point that I want you to remember. You're going to spend the majority of your life doing, not achieving. And it's so important to enjoy the doing as well as the achieving. And if you can do that, you will enjoy your entire life. So healthy achievers enjoy the doing, not just the achieving. It's not just about the destination for them. It's about the journey along the way. It's about the process of learning. It's about the exploration. It's about the expansion. It's about the fun because learning is fun. Learning something new, getting creative, expanding yourself, that's fun. So enjoy the doing, not just the achieving. 
Another thing that healthy achievers do is they're their own best friends. This means they're their own best coach. They expect great things from themselves, but they're also compassionate and kind to themselves. They cheer themselves on instead of criticizing themselves to death. When things don't go as expected, they realize they're human and that failure is a part of learning. They don't let that failure define themselves completely. It is just an experience they had. It's not who they are. Healthy achievers also aren't afraid to feel difficult feelings. They welcome all the parts of themselves and they learn from what all their parts bring to the table. Remember when we talked about internal family systems? All of your parts are valuable. There are no bad parts. They're all trying to talk to you and tell you about their experience and help you learn about yourself so you can navigate your life. And so healthy achievers are open to that. They feel confident that they can handle anything they learn about themselves. Whereas insecure overachievers and perfectionists, they orchestrate their lives, including the crazy busy schedule, in order to avoid feeling difficult things. Everything they do is to avoid feelings of failure, avoid their insecurity, avoid that imposter syndrome, avoid other people thinking poorly of them. Those things are naturally uncomfortable, but a healthy achiever knows, like, I can handle my uncomfortable feelings. A anxious or insecure overachiever doesn't feel capable of handling those feelings, and they do everything they can to avoid them. Now, just a quick side note, if feeling comfortable with your feelings is something you struggle with, please consider going and joining the Emancipate Yourself app. It's on Apple or Google. I have created a course that will walk you through each step of getting acquainted with your emotions and learning how to work with them instead of against them to get a life that lights you up. The app includes a weekly group coaching call where you can get all your questions answered. You're going to get one-on-one time with me. We're going to work through your questions in live real time. And bonus, the first seven days are free. So it's a no-brainer. I will say this, if you're thinking of joining, don't join this week because I am headed to Texas to spend time with my family and we will not be having a group coaching call on July 4th. It's a holiday in the United States and I am taking the day off, but we will be back at it on July 11th. So if you're thinking about doing this and you wanna do the seven-day trial, wait until after July 4th, sign up for the seven-day trial, join us for the call on July 11th. We would love to have you there. And I would say even join a couple of days early so you have a chance to work through some of the courses. You'll have access to this mind-body course that helps you work through your emotions, but you're also gonna have access to a course that helps you rebuild your identity after religious transition. You're also gonna have access to like the whole past year of live group coaching calls if that's something you want to listen to. So highly recommend that. It's amazing. Go over there, check it out. It has been life-changing for so many people. All right, healthy achievers also have realistic expectations of themselves. They adjust their expectations of themselves as their circumstances change. Who here in their unhealthy overachievement, and I am guilty too, I'm guilty of this right now. I'm actually, as I'm researching all of this, I'm making adjustments. I'm getting really introspective with myself and being like, oh, yeah, that's not working for me. So I'm making adjustments to my personal and professional life right now in order to confront this pattern in my life. So if you're struggling with this, don't feel bad. I'm right there with you. We're all in this together. These are all things that we have to confront. And not just once. I've done this work at least half a dozen times of being like, okay, I'm getting back into this unhealthy overachievement pattern. Let me figure out what's going on here and what I need to adjust in order to get back to a healthy space. So the goal here is not to be perfectly healthy. We are all going to get back into our unhealthy patterns when our nervous systems are overwhelmed, which all of us in the last two and a half years have lots of good reasons for our nervous systems to be overwhelmed. When we're uncertain, lots of uncertainty in the world, right? You're going through a religious transition. We're still kind of in the middle of a pandemic. 
There's all sorts of crazy stuff going on politically. Lots of uncertainty right now. It would make sense if you're going back to old patterns or like doubling down. I don't know if you've ever done that before. If you have a pattern, but like when things get really anxious, you double down, you like really, really commit to that pattern and take it to the nth degree. I've been there and done that too. So when your circumstances change, if you want to be in healthy achievement, you've got to adjust your expectations. If you get sick or if you're traveling or if you have an unexpected event come up, you have to adjust your expectations to meet your resources at the time. I can be really guilty of committing myself to do something and then something changes in my life, but because I said I would do the thing and I would do it a certain way, I don't adjust that expectation. And I try to continue to keep up the workload that I committed to while my time and energy resources are going elsewhere. They're leaking out into this other thing. So instead of getting honest with myself, making adjustments, I I try to do it all. And a lot of overachievers do that. And it can kind of sneak in like this obligation here and that obligation there. And before you know it, you have a gajillion obligations. You're trying to keep your word. You don't feel like you can clear any of them off your plate because you said yes at a time when you could and now you can't. So I'm telling you right now, if you find yourself in that position, as I currently do, because I have a bazillion things on my plate and some of them I did not ask for, but they're just part of parenting, then you have to reevaluate and you have to say, okay, I only have 24 hours in the day and I must sleep for eight of them or I'm a cranky monster. And so I have to look realistically at what I can actually do during the day without burning out? How can I make this a win-win? What is reasonable? Give yourself time to get introspective. It's what a healthy achiever does. And I need you to know your confidence may fluctuate. When you're in healthy achievement, your confidence may fluctuate, but your self-worth won't. Your self-worth or your healthy attachment to yourself, your belonging to yourself, it stays relatively stable. Even when you're back in patterns, this is the thing that's changed for me. I'm back in an overachieving pattern, but I'm not on top of that shaming myself for being in an overachieving pattern. I just recognize like, oh, I've been burnt out for a few weeks now, actually. And there's reasons for that. I've actually been sitting with this ever since the episode two weeks ago where we started talking about why is it so hard to rest? I've been sitting with that, like, why am I having a hard time resting? And why do I feel overly busy? What's going on for me? What is this giving me? What are the benefits? Because we wouldn't do our behaviors if they're not benefiting us in some way. So I often get curious and say, okay, I'm doing this behavior I don't like. It's not serving me. There's likely a valid reason why I'm doing this. It's either protecting me in some way or it's giving me some kind of benefit. Being overly busy right now is giving me benefits, but it's also hurting me. So I sit down and I say, okay, in what ways is it hurting me? What benefits is it giving me? And can I brainstorm ways to get those benefits or to create a benefit that's even better that also gets rid of some of the negative aspects. In a nutshell, I ask, is there a healthier way for me to get the benefits? And I allow myself to sit with that and get curious with that and get creative and try things on even. Sometimes I'll try a solution on just to see if it works. And after a couple of days, I'm like, okay, that didn't work. What if we tweaked it and we did this and I'll try that? And so I'm in the middle of that right now, trying things on, seeing what works. What do I have capacity for? What do I not have capacity for? Is there a way for me to get rid of things off of my plate entirely? Is there a way for me to delegate things? Is there a way for me to change my expectations of myself? How can I meet my needs and get the benefits I need and also stay emotionally, mentally, and physically healthy. How do I do that? And I'm trying things on right now. I don't have the answers for my current situation, but I'm getting curious. 
and I'm allowing myself to listen to answers and take action. So know that if you are in a place of overwhelm, it's not because you're a bad person, you're not broken, you're not disadvantaged. You are trying to protect yourself and there are benefits you're getting. And it's just time to get curious and figure out, is there a healthier way for me to get these benefits? Or do I even need these benefits anymore? Maybe these are benefits you needed as a child, but you've moved past that. And that's okay. Now to end this episode, I really want to talk about five ideas to help you move into healthy achievement. The first one, and this one is so hard for many of us because we are genuinely addicted. We get dopamine hits from this. And if this is in front of us, we will engage. And that is social media. Reevaluate your social media consumption, especially if you are an overachiever. We often compare ourselves to other people. We have insider information about our lives. We know our highs and our lows. We know about that insecurity that nobody else knows about. We know about our imposter syndrome. We know about the worries that people will call us out and call us a fraud or call us a fake or that they'll know that our house is messy until somebody comes over, right? Or that they'll know that we eat mac and cheese instead of, you know, the vegetables that we're posting online, whatever. We know our deep, dirty secrets. We know that. But we don't post about those on social media. And our friends and family aren't either. They're posting their highlight reel. And I know you cognitively know this, but when we're scrolling social media, not only are we consuming a lot of negativity right now, but we're also consuming comparison, which can drive this unhealthy need for achievement. It can drive that insecurity that makes us want to really dig into this pattern to help us get those hits of dopamine that come from achieving things and hearing people tell us how wonderful we are. Because that's exactly what's happening, is it's like a drug. We achieve something, feels really great, we get a hit of dopamine. Other people tell us we're fabulous, we get a hit of dopamine. And We put it on social media. Other people like it and heart it. Lots of little hits of dopamine to see how many people like it. And then as soon as that praise runs out, as soon as people quit validating us quite as much, we feel like we have to hit the ground running again to fill up that insecurity. There's actually a quote by Michael Lim that I read while reading up on overachieving before this episode that just, ugh hit me in the feels. And it says, hunger for admiration begins with a void and ends with a void. I'm going to say it one more time. Hunger for admiration, which is what insecure or anxious overachievement is about. It's this hunger for admiration. It's this hunger for validation. It begins with a void, that void of self-worth that feeling that we're not enough. It begins with that void, but after the achievement, it also ends with that void. That achievement, those accolades, all of that praise, it like puts a balm on it only for a minute, but it wears out. And then we're left with the void. Hunger for admiration begins with a void and ends with a void. So reevaluate your social media consumption. Consider limiting your time. Consider taking it off your phone so it's not always dinging you. Consider putting your phone on silent. My phone is on do not disturb 99% of the time. The only people that can get through are my kids, my husband, the schools, and some select family members. Everyone else, I schedule time to check my phone. I schedule time to check social media. I'm not on there constantly because it's just not good for me mentally. I noticed several months ago that I was spending too much time comparing my work with other people's work. And comparison is the thief of joy. My work is mine. 
It comes from my heart and my soul, so of course it's going to be different than anyone else's work. So I limit my time on social media now, and I limit how much interaction I'm having with other people's content simply because right now it's just not healthy, and that's okay. It might be healthier later in the future. So if you're really struggling with this, consider limiting your social media intake. Now, the second one is going to seem a little bit funny. This came from a recent experience in my neighborhood. So we've been having a drought here in Colorado, and a lot of people's grass is starting to look a little brown. And there was a lawn... (laughs) not far away from my house that I walk past on a daily basis. And one day it was very brown. And the next day it was like electric green, like a very, very bright, vibrant green. And from far away, I was like, oh my gosh, what did they do to their lawn? It looks amazing. But as I got closer, their grass was spray painted. So just remember that the grass may look greener in someone else's lawn or on the other side. But that doesn't mean it's not spray painted. Remember, we have access to our own deep, dark, dirty secrets. But just because somebody looks like their life is ideal, I promise you they have their own struggles. They have their own insecurities. They have their own disappointments. And if we really sat down and got to know someone else, we would understand that their life has struggles too. Their life has hardships. And often we wouldn't switch our life with their life, no matter how green it looks. The next one is redefine your definition of success. This one is so powerful. We talked about in the episode on internalized capitalism, how we kind of have this one definition of success In the United States, it often has to do with more money. It often has to do with working hard. It often has to do with just kind of this American dream, the white picket fence, the 2.5 kids, the home in the suburbs. There's this kind of 1950s, leave it to beaver, kind of an understanding of what success looks like. But that doesn't have to be success for you. Success is what lights you up. What would feel delicious to you? Allow yourself to sit down and just ask yourself, what kind of relationships do I want? What do I want my family to be like? Ideally, how would I want to live? I have a client that wants to live in a tiny home out in the mountains away from everyone. Success would look like having lots of time to go fishing, lots of time to go hiking, and the ability to watch the sunset peacefully every single night. That's their definition of success. What is your definition of success? It doesn't have to be the McMansion. It doesn't have to be the Porsche. It doesn't have to be anything that you've been told is traditionally success. Success can be getting to go salsa dancing every Tuesday night. Success can be getting to go on a girls weekend with two or three people you feel really close to and belly laughing over glasses of wine. Success gets to be what lights you up. You get to define success. So often we overachieve because we're trying to fulfill society's idea of success Or we're trying to fulfill our parents' idea of success. And we haven't really stopped to get curious about, is this actually success for me? Is this really what I want? Is this really what I crave? Allow yourself to get curious about that and honest with yourself. And the last one is to keep a win book. I call mine a hype book, but... Keep a folder or a box or a journal where you can celebrate your successes, even the small ones, the kind things that people say to you, the difference that you're making in the world, the ways that you showed up that you're really proud of. Allow yourself to write in it. Schedule time often 
It doesn't have to be every day, but it could be every week. Schedule 10 minutes or an hour, however long feels good for you, and write down your wins. Write down your successes. Write down the ways that you're creating that life that feels delicious to you. All that evidence. Write it down. Some of the things I've included are like small things. My youngest son recently gave me a note that said, I feel safe with you. That's all it said. But that's in my hype book because for me, success is my kids and my husband feeling safe with me and me feeling safe with them. That we've created bonds where it is completely 100% okay to show up as ourselves and we will have conversations until everybody feels seen and heard. To have one of my children say, I feel safe with you, was like one of the hugest successes I could ever have. And it's in my hype book. I have other things that have come from you, my listeners, where you've said, you spoke about a topic that finally clicked for me and it changed my life. Or, I'm so glad I found your podcast. I felt so alone before and now I feel less alone. These are the kinds of things that go in my hype book. Other things that go in my hype book are learning new dance routines or like tonight, I just created an entirely new hamburger from scratch. I create hamburger recipes a lot. Sandwich and hamburgers are like my thing. I have these kind of like weird fantasies of opening a restaurant or a food truck at some point in my life, maybe an alternate life in another life. I don't know. But tonight I created this spicy bacon elote burger from scratch. I put together things that I love and I created this burger and it was amazing. We gorged ourselves tonight. But that's going in my hype book because it's a small win. It's a success. It's something I'm proud of. It's something I love about myself. And so it's going to go into the hype book. Put things in your hype book that will help you when you find yourself stuck in negativity bias. I guarantee you, I'm going to have times where I feel like an imposter. I'm going to have times where I feel bad about a mistake I've made or a time I've stuck my foot in my mouth or not showed up the way I wanted to show up or I've dropped the ball because I'm human. And so when that happens, when I'm trying to be a good friend to myself, first, compassion. Reminding myself that I'm a good person. Reminding myself that I have worth and that that can't be taken away no matter how many mistakes I make. And then I get to work on the problem because that's what I would do as a coach for myself. I reaffirm my worth and then I get to work on the problem. I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope that you feel seen. I hope that you feel validated and I hope you feel empowered to move forward. Please, if you had an aha moment during this podcast, go and share your experiences on the Emancipate Yourself Facebook group. Go talk about what you learned. Ask questions. Get that validation from others. That's what it's there for. We're there to have a sense of community and to share about ourselves so that we can be there for one another. I look forward to hearing what stood out to you. I look forward to hearing any additional insights you have so that I can learn from you. Because like I said, I'm in this with you. Thank you again for joining me. And I will see you next Sunday.